Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Neil Lane. I'm a senior fellow at the Baker Institute, and it is a great pleasure to welcome you this evening to Rice University and to the Baker Institute for the annual Civic Science Lecture with our distinguished speaker of the evening, Dr. Shirley Jackson, who is president of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, or RPI, for those, those of us who are word challenged and can't remember if it's two S's or two N's. So I'll use RPI. My relationship with Dr. Jackson goes back a ways, and I'll comment about that in a minute. A little housekeeping, there are little cards on the chairs. And if you have questions, which I hope you do, please write them down and hold them up. Not real high, but sort of high, and somebody will come by and get them from you. And then after uh, Dr. Jackson's talk, we will uh, pick out the most challenging and unnerving questions, because those, those are the kinds I know she likes best. Tonight's program is an activity of the Baker Institute's Science and Technology Policy Program. It's managed by Dr. Kirsten Matthews of the Baker Institute, and the goal of this program is to bring together scientists, policymakers, and business and community leaders to stimulate discussions and, whenever possible, to promote real progress, to really make something happen in such areas as K-12 math and science education, the role of women and underrepresented minorities in science and engineering, medical research policy, and our current focus is on stem cells, the public's understanding of science, and the reverse, the scientists' understanding of the public, and the integrity of science, both how it's practiced by researchers and also how it's used or misused by government uh, or, or industry or others in the community. We sponsor speakers, conferences, workshops, we carry out studies, we write research papers and opinion pieces, and we work with other Baker Institute uh, colleagues to support their programs in such areas as energy, climate change, space, information technology, international relations, health care, and several other areas. One of our special projects, and perhaps it's the one closest to my heart, is the Civic Scientist Lecture Series, which brings to Rice and the Baker Institute, as well as the Houston community, leading scientists who've made a significant impact, and I want to add positive impact, on public policy. Indeed, that concept really defines the notion of civic scientists. Last year's lecture was given by Dr. Arden Bement, who's director of the National Science Foundation. With these lectures, we're highlighting individual women and men who, after successful research careers, discovering new knowledge, inventing new technologies, have taken their skills to the policy domain, where application of the fruits of scientific knowledge can benefit millions, perhaps billions, of people in this country and throughout the world. Examples of civic scientists include one of our founding fathers, Benjamin Franklin, who gave us our earliest understanding of the nature of electricity and then took time out from his science, in fact left science, to help put together a new nation. Another example is the late and great scientist, chemist, Richard Smalling, who used his knowledge and his prestige gained from winning the Nobel Prize with Rice's Bob Curl and the UK's Harry Croto to educate the public and policymakers about our future energy challenges. And without question, Dr. Shirley Jackson is a model civic scientist. She's the first African-American woman to receive a doctorate from MIT in any subject. She's also one of the first African-American women to receive a doctorate in physics in the United States. Her PhD thesis was on theoretical elementary particle physics. Well, she not only mastered this difficult field, she went on to apply her skills to theoretical condensed matter and optical physics. Uh, also very challenging fields, but fields that are closer to application uh, through industry. She's had remarkable careers working uh, in industry at AT&T Bell Labs and academia at Rutgers University and Rensselaer Polytech Institute and the federal government as chair of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission during the Clinton administration, which is which, where I really had the opportunity to get to know Shirley and work with her. I think you know that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the NRC, is the agency responsible for assuring the safety and security of the entire U.S. nuclear power industry. Remember, that's 20 percent of our electricity. I think Benjamin Franklin would be amazed to hear that. 
Among the things Dr. Jackson did, among the many things I might add, when she was uh, at the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, was to create something called the International Nuclear Regulators Association, which brings together counterparts all across the globe. Nuclear energy is a world matter, and safety and security are only possible if those who regulate the industry in each country cooperate with one another. Dr. Jackson has received many honors, including her election as a member of the National Academy of Engineering, fellow of the American Physical Society and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and she's a fellow and past president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the largest, world's largest general scientific society. She, re she was recently honored by the National Science Foundation's National Science Board with the 2007 Vannevar Bush Award given each year to an individual who through public service activities in science and technology has made an outstanding contribution toward the welfare of mankind and the nation. Currently, Dr. Jackson is president of Rensselaer Polytech Institute, where she's led the development of the Rensselaer Plan, the Institute's strategic blueprint, which has already begun transforming RPI. Well, one thing you really need to know about Shirley Jackson is that wherever she goes, however hard the job is, whatever seemingly impossible things need to be changed to get the job done, she does the job. She gets those changes made, and the place ends up being transformed. Well, tonight, Dr. Jackson will be addressing issues of great concern to all of us in the United States, indeed throughout the world, and where without a doubt transformation is needed. The title of her talk is From Uncertainty to Opportunity, Creating a Comprehensive Energy Roadmap and the Human Capital to Make it Happen. It's my great personal pleasure and a singular honor to introduce to you my good friend and colleague, Dr. Shirley Jackson. Well, good evening, and I want to thank you for that very warm introduction. Um, you know, being in a place like this, the Baker Institute, and we know that uh, James Baker was uh, Secretary of State, uh, and having spent time in Washington, you know, it's always easier if people can simply say, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. But I'm President of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. <laughs> I'm very proud of it. And it is an honor to be, I believe, the second speaker in this prestigious series and to have this opportunity to share some thoughts with you here in the nation's energy capital. And let me also take the opportunity to thank and congratulate my good friend and colleague, Dr. Neil Lane, for conceiving and bringing to fruition this innovative lecture series. And Dr. Lane has cited Benjamin Franklin, actually, as an inspiration noted this, that noting that this early American uh, prototype of a civic scientist addressed the young nation's concerns with wisdom and practicality and especially a deep sense of civic responsibility. And we share, I share, uh, Franklin's belief that properly applied scientific breakthroughs and technological innovation can accrue to the betterment of all humanity. And that has driven a lot of my uh, later career. Through forums such as this, we have the opportunity to consider large problems of global significance, problems that will affect not only our nation, but the entire world. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about one of those topics this evening. Because we are witnessing and experiencing extraordinary turbulence and uncertainty in the global energy system. There is, among many, a palpable sense that the situation is out of control or may be going there. Out of our control, certainly. Within the United States, one hears uh, more and more a call for energy independence. Americans, you know, have a historical affinity for the concept of independence. Almost exactly 34 years ago, President Richard M. Nixon issued such a call. Three weeks after the shock of the Arab oil embargo, the price of oil had catapulted to an unprecedented $11 per barrel. President Nixon introduced Project Independence on national television and pledged that the country 
within seven years will, quote, meet our energy needs without depending on any foreign energy source. That was his quote. Needless to say, uh, Project Independence fell short, as did similar initiatives by Presidents Ford, Carter, and the first President Bush. Despite the best of intentions, over the last 30 years, we went from importing a third of our oil in 1973 to nearly two-thirds today. Now, I believe energy independence is a troubling misnomer. In fact, I was just on Biz Radio, and it's interesting to try to explain energy independence as being somewhat of a misnomer. And that is because energy uncertainty extends far beyond the borders of the United States and concerns the entire planet and its people. Uh, as one energy company has noted, there are more than 190 recognized countries in the world, and it has been observed that none of them is energy independent. And so our vision has to be for energy security, and our goals and our thinking need to be in a, in a broader global context in order to act wisely, comprehensively, and effectively. Because the energy challenge is a key part of a multifaceted and growing challenge confronting the interconnected world in which we all live. Furthermore, there's a bit of acute urgency to this challenge because we are witnessing and becoming more aware of a worldwide surge in energy consumption driven, of course, by population growth, higher standards of living, and increasing reliance on energy-dependent technologies. From 1950 to the year 2000, the world population rose from 2.5 to 6 billion people. Water use tripled, as did grain production. The number of automobiles grew from 53 million in 1950 to 539 million in 2003. And with the introduction of commercial jet aircraft in the 1950s, air traffic mushroomed. And it mushroomed from about 28 billion passenger kilometers at mid-century to more than 2.9 trillion in 2002. Now you'll hear me switch from the metric system to the English system all the time. It's the consequence of being a scientist, but one who talks in the public policy arena. You know that worldwide energy consumption per capita today is roughly 13 times higher than in pre-industrial times. And that is only the average rate, because we should bear in mind that there are still 2.4 billion people, more than a third of the world's people, who have no access to modern energy services. And failure actually to resolve today's uncertainty and to achieve adequate, sustainable energy supplies will leave billions of people in underdeveloped countries stranded in energy poverty with all the attendant implications, inadequate access to food and water, inability to combat infectious disease, lack of education, and sometimes civil unrest. In short, a large section of the Earth's population would be unable to progress. And so we are nowhere near the end point of the energy consumption chart. Over the next 50 years, if current trends continue, humans will use more energy than in all of previously recorded history. But failure in the other direction, in terms of overconsumption, following our current fossil use patterns, holds its own implications for major environmental impact. So where will the energy come from? From what fuels will it be derived? Can our planet, a planet of limited resource and yet interconnected commerce, sustain the impact? How can we achieve higher standards of living for all while maintaining our own and while addressing legitimate concerns about the environment? Well, we must learn to think in different ways and new ways about energy because a convergence of multiple factors makes it bluntly obvious that a comprehensive global energy system restructuring has begun. My friends are here from Marathon, 
and I'm proud to say that I'm actually a member of the board of directors of Marathon Oil Company. I think they're proud that I'm on that board. But I think they would agree that this energy, global energy system restructuring has begun. The open question is, will the United States lead the inevitable restructuring, or will it occur without us? The combined forces of energy supply uncertainty, rising energy costs, and the impact of climate change are major drivers. Against this backdrop, I'd like to examine with you for a few minutes six elements of this restructuring. First, growing energy demand is driving new markets worldwide, creating opportunity, options for new players, and concern at the same time. Second, new major players have emerged on the energy scene who are changing the terms of reference for traditional energy alignments, especially with regard to oil and gas supply. Third, nations themselves are realigning in new ways, shifting old alliances. Fourth, with rising energy costs, corporations are swiftly realigning their priorities, changing how they do business and making investments to secure market opportunity. Fifth, Climate change mitigation linked to energy security is creating itself new markets, including investments in new sources and new technologies and new trading schemes. And sixth and finally, oil generated wealth and other actors are changing who plays in global financial markets. These factors already are in play, altering how the global energy system works affecting who plays, how they play, and who reaps the rewards. So let us examine each of them a little bit. The unprecedented economic development and industrialization of China and India are creating tremendous pressure on energy markets worldwide. But it's not just them. Others are beginning to develop as, as well, including the Middle East, which itself has been the source of so much oil. And this pressure is straining global oil trade, driving prices higher, and contributing uh, as well to higher carbon dioxide emissions. Moreover, the population of these two nations alone are predicted to grow by about 240 million people between 2005 and 2015, adding to the pressure and consuming new production capacity. A November 7th report by the International Energy Agency indicated that China and India accounted for about 70 percent of the increase in energy demand in the last two years. That number has changed since I gave a speech on this subject back in March. It was more like 50 percent. Energy use in these two nations is projected to double between 2005 and 2030, by which time they will account for nearly half of the increase in global demand, half because other countries are rising as well. Yet in energy use per person is considerably lower in, than in developed nations such as ours. And the IEA, the International Energy Agency, urged advanced economies to work with China and India to cut overall growth in energy consumption. The report predicted that China would become the largest energy consumer soon after 2010, overtaking the United States. In India, where more than 400 million people have no access to electricity, energy demand nonetheless is expected to more than double by 2030. At the same time, net in oil imports for these two nations will climb to 19 million barrels a day, up from 4.5 million barrels in 2006. And so the thing is spiraling. The unprecedented growth in energy markets, in energy use rather, has impacted markets. The power and influence of global traders and investors over oil markets has been increasing gradually for some time. Before 1980, international oil companies 
had long-term contracts which set prices and volumes, and relatively small amounts were traded daily on what was called the spot market. I remember that from the days when I first went on to a utility board, an oil and gas utility. In 1983, the New York uh, Mercantile Exchange, the Dimex, opened a market for crude oil that has grown steadily. And now most major oil companies tie their sales and purchases to fluctuating prices on that exchange. But with the emergence of new energy markets, traditional corporate and country alignments are shifting, creating new alliances and cooperative arrangements, and completely altering not only the geopolitics of energy, production, distribution, and markets, but also relationships between and among nations as well. The original seven sisters, Western countries, that control Middle East oil after World War II, have begun to lose prominence to a new set of seven. Saudi Aramco, Russia's Gazprom, China's CNPC, NIOC of, Vene of Iran, uh, Venezuela's PDVSA, Brazil's Petrobras, and Petronas of Malaysia control almost a third of the world's oil and gas production and more than a third of its total oil and gas reserves. The old Seven Sisters, which became four after mergers in the 1990s, Chevron, Exxon, Mobil, BP, and Royal Dutch Shell produce about 10% of the world's oil and gas and hold around 5% of the reserves. The International Energy Agency estimates that 90% of new production supplies over the next four decades will in fact come from developing countries, which is a big shift from the past 30 years when 40% came from industrialized nations. This asymmetry is leading supply countries and their national oil companies to change contract terms with traditional international oil and gas companies and to shift alliances to have greater ownership of assets and greater oil revenue shares, but increasingly are interested in so-called downstream activities as well, to create more refined and higher uh, profit margin products themselves. Global energy markets are already impacted as supplier country-based companies uh, regulate the price of oil and gas by controlling production. And if they control more integrated supply chains, the effect on global energy markets where the revenues flow and economies overall would be even more dramatic. You know that some $700 billion annually are accruing to the world's oil exporting countries. Uh, Venezuela's new oil wealth gives it powerful new influence among traditional U.S. allies in South America. Iran can better sustain economic sanctions over its nuclear program. Saudi Arabia is stabilizing its social system by building four new cities and new research universities, burnishing its image in the process. Angola has joined OPEC and is cooperating less than it used to with the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. The fact that the new sisters are state controlled and that growth in the oil and gas industry has a big resting place in their hands is restructuring national and international alliances and will impact them for decades. The emergence of the sisters from the oil rich countries has been the basis for the creation of so-called sovereign wealth funds, uh, nation owned financial entities which give they are countries' tremendous investment power. And I'm going to return to those shortly. I'll give you another uh, true confession. Uh, I'm on the board of uh, the New York Stock Exchange. You're next. So I see these things uh, firsthand in the broader markets. Now, all of these challenges are global in reach, but each region and country is affected differently based on factors such as indigenous fuel sources, relationships to other supplier countries, reliability of infrastructure, economic stability, the degree of attention given to environmental concerns, and how government leaders 
and the public at large view the risks and benefits of different energy sources. Variations in how these factors are weighted in the policy-making process of a given country can lead to contrasting strategies for achieving energy security, even though the effect of these decisions are likely to extend to other countries and regions. In a recent example, Gas Uni, the Dutch uh, national gas company, has taken a stake, about 9%, in the controversial Nord Stream pipeline project. And this pipeline, controlled by Gazprom, the Russian gas monopoly, would carry gas directly from Russia under the Baltic Sea to Germany, bypassing Poland, Belarus, Ukraine, and the Baltic states. The Baltic states in particular are objecting to the pipeline on the basis of environmental concerns. For others, such as Poland, it means a revenue loss from transit fees. For yet others, it can su directly affect supply. Ukraine comes to mind. The deal also gives Gazprom the option to acquire from Gas Uni a 9% stake in a pipeline that connects the Netherlands and the UK. And this would give Gazprom a stake in a British supply pipeline for the first time. So moves such as this are occurring as more and more countries in the EU worry about energy supply, especially oil and gas. The European Commission estimates that over the next 20 to 30 years, energy import dependence will rise to 70% overall and 90% for oil, unless there's action taken to reduce that. And so this is causing the EU to develop strategies for new and renewable sources of energy and energy efficiency, both to assure supply through diversification and to mitigate climate change. The European Union already is the world leader in renewable energy technology and holds 60% of the market share in wind technology. And finally, we all know that China is on a worldwide march to lock up energy supplies as well as access to other resources such as minerals and heavy metals. And this especially is seen in its presence in Africa where it trades assistance, infrastructure development, sometimes education, and always embassy presence and diplomatic recognition for such access. And over time, China's move and the increased involvement of ASEAN countries, and Malaysia comes to mind, surely will reshape sub-Saharan African countries' alignments. And it's something I worry about because our oil and gas companies are involved, but it's not clear where we are as a country and as a government. Worldwide, corporations themselves are making changes to mitigate the impact of high energy costs and and uh, climate change anticipation of regulation uh, to their bottom lines and to exploit business opportunities inherent in the need for alternative sustainable energy sources. A uh, 2007 report by the United Nations Environment Programs Global Trends in Sustainable Energy Investments found that investment capital flowing into sustainable energy, especially wind, solar, and biofuels more than doubled in just two years, from uh, 28 billion in 2004 to 71 billion in 2006. The trajectory continues. So what are some of the companies doing? Uh, Microsoft, Google, Google, and HSBC, the bank, are building data centers alongside hydropower sources to better manage the electric power they demand. PepsiCo and Coca-Cola have pledged to buy more than 1.1 billion kilowatt hours of renewable energy over the next three years. And Walmart has been a leader in stocking energy efficient products and has reduced the packaging material of some of its goods to lower energy and carbon content. As one of the largest industrial users of energy in the world, Dow Chemical has an intense self-interest 
in reducing its energy consumption and improving overall energy efficiency. And so it has committed to a decade-long reduction in energy intensity to 25 percent below what it consumed in 2005. It's also committed to developing alternative energy sources. Now what is significant about the anticipated growth in global demand for energy is that so much of it will occur in countries that really are not prepared to reduce their dependence on fossil fuels. In fact, more of the current rapid increase in Chinese and Indian electrical generating capacity is in fact coming in the form of coal-fired power plants. And the projection is that coal use will increase in the coming decades. China is projected to become the largest emitter of greenhouse gases within a couple of years and other pollutants. And the reason I say we can't talk about energy security or climate change without talking globally is that the effect of what's happening in China is being felt globally and all the way to California, where by some estimates, estimates by the EPA, 30 percent of the background sulfate particulate matter in the western U.S. originates in Asia. And so it is important not just to jawbone countries like China, because why should they not develop? And they have great energy needs as they develop. But to help rapidly developing countries like China to gain energy efficiencies in manufacturing and in products while reducing its carbon footprint as much as possible. In fact, multinational corporations are working with their Chinese suppliers to help them to reduce costs by reducing energy use and carbon load. And this includes new management techniques and new technologies. And that creates new opportunities, in fact, for trade and for commerce with China. So it's not just about the traditional things we talk about, but ones that relate specifically to their energy security and climate change mitigation. Now globalization of capital, climate change mitigation, and mounting investment volume from multiple sources are creating opportunities for new markets as well. Now, some such as the European Trading Scheme, the ETS, or the UN Clean Development Mechanism are government sponsored, established under the Kyoto Protocol. But others have sprung up voluntarily, uh, such as the Chicago Climate Exchange, which integrates voluntary legally binding emissions reductions with emissions trading and offsets for six greenhouse gases. Carbon content of fuels is becoming uh, very focused in this country, as well as of processes and the carbon content of commercial and consumer goods. In fact, earlier this month, a Senate subcommittee approved a bill to establish a cap-and-trade system for carbon dioxide in which allowances would cost money, although it's not clear yet what the House of Representatives will do. And I was just at an energy conference sponsored by the Washington Post, in fact, where a panel of senators and uh, members of the House spoke. And they are really all over the place. It really depends on what state they're from. Others have proposed a carbon tax to reduce carbon load. Now, all of these schemes in the end would have industry and the consumer pay the carbon cost. A carbon tax and a cap and trade system both depend upon the ability to measure the true carbon content of products and processes in a consistent way, to have transparency about that. Some believe an auction system would give uh, more transparency. Companies are beginning to jump into this in a big way, sometimes in anticipation of regulation, sometimes for straight out business reasons. I have to say, and you know I would talk about it, concerns about climate change and energy security have contributed to a resurgence of interest in nuclear power. Now in principle, in principle, nuclear energy satisfies many of the optimum requirements for enhancing energy security with climate change mitigation. Because nuclear power produces virtually no sulfur dioxide particulates 
nitrogen oxides, volatile organic compounds, or greenhouse gases. In fact, the complete cycle from resource extraction to waste disposal emits only about two to six grams of carbon equivalent per kilowatt hour. And this is about the same as wind and solar if one includes construction and component manufacturing and is orders of magnitude below other sources, but in particular fossil sources. And unlike small wind and solar facilities, nuclear power can supply the large baseload capacity needed to support large urban centers, but especially importantly to stabilize large electrical grids. And when we have had uh, blackouts and plants, plants tripping offline, you should go back and take a look that not many of those were nuclear plants. Nuclear plants tend to stabilize uh, grids. The renewed interest in nuclear power takes different forms in different regions. The heaviest concentration of new nuclear power plant construction currently is in Asia, especially in China. In Europe, Finland and France are constructing the new European pressurized reactor. Earlier this year, the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the NRC, my old agency, approved the first nuclear power plant site in over 30 years in central Illinois, a plant that if built would be operated by Exelon. And more recently, the energy company NRG has in fact submitted to the NRC an application for a combined construction and operating license to build a new GE design plant here in Texas at an existing site. And at a meeting in March, uh, EU leaders agreed in their overall scheme in looking at climate change that a country's nuclear power capability will be taken into account when calculating its national commitments to renewable energy, both because of climate change and because of wanting energy sources. Now, one of the most controversial aspects today of nuclear power which I have sometimes referred to as the Achilles heel of the nuclear industry, relates to the management and disposal of spent fuel. Now, in a sense, the amount of spent nuclear fuel produced annually is actually small when you consider uh, carbon waste from uh, fossil fuels. But given the intense polarization around nuclear energy generally, and the new nuclear waste issue specifically, public opinion will likely remain skeptical until a waste repository or other fuel cycle closure solutions have been demonstrated. And I'll be happy to talk about some of that a little later. But in the U.S., uh, while the federal government has been making progress toward building a nuclear waste repository, at Yucca Mountain in Nevada, due to state opposition, no license application has been filed by the Department of Energy uh, with the NRC. The Department of Energy would build it. The NRC would license and oversee it until closure. But in the meantime, the trend has been to construct and to use above ground interim storage facilities. And many countries are exploring the feasibility of interim storage for 100 years or more. Research and development is progressing as well on the use of fast reactors and accelerator-driven systems to incinerate or transmute long-lived uh, nuclear waste in order to reduce both volume and radiotoxicity to still to be sent to geologic repositories. So let me kind of make the bottom line statement. The bottom line statement is that in the end, at least with known technologies today, one is going to bury or have to get rid of some form of nuclear waste coming from spent fuel. The real question is how much in terms of volume, with what degree of radiotoxicity, and how long lived. And that's important because one has to think about how engineered systems married with geologic knowledge about geologic processes over time will keep that waste isolated. But nonetheless, the importance of nuclear power 
has led to the renewal of the operating licenses of 48 out of the country's 104 nuclear power reactors. And in fact, virtually all U.S. nuclear plants either have filed for renewal already or are expected to file. And this is to extend the license of the existing plants for 20 additional years so that they would operate for 60 years overall. And many energy companies find this economically attractive because it requires relatively little capital expenditure and provides a longer amortization period for expenditures that are made and offsets the short-term need for new generating capacity. I don't know that, it, that many of you know how much work is going on outside of the United States on several advanced and innovative concepts for nuclear plants. There is the Generation 4 International Nuclear Forum, which is a U.S.-led project in which France, the U.K., and the EU are members. And they're moving toward R&D on six innovative reactor concepts. Russia has licensed a reactor design uh, that could be floated on a barge, which takes advantage of their experience with nuclear-powered icebreakers and submarines. The Republic of Korea has what is called a smart pressurized water reactor. And South Africa recently approved funding for developing a demonstration unit of what is called a gas-cooled pebble bed reactor. Now, nuclear plants, as I said, their operating costs are actually low compared to other sources. But on the other hand, they are capital intensive in terms of initial investments. And so they also require a very sophisticated regulatory in infrastructure to ensure independent safety, safety oversight. And many companies and countries feel they need their governments to reduce the initial risk to make the investment. Let me talk a bit about oil-generated wealth and financial markets. In the financial services sector, sovereign wealth funds have emerged as important new players in global financial and energy markets. Worldwide, it is estimated that some $3 trillion have been assembled in these sovereign wealth funds, especially out of the Middle East, and is likely to reach $7.5 trillion by 2012. Now, the availability of these funds, their sovereign support, and their appetite for risk offers both challenges and opportunities for governments and corporations and for the global financial system because they have an appetite for risk that traditional financial sources do not have. And these funds, together with central banks in emerging markets, hedge funds and private equity are beginning to play in a major way into financial transactions ranging from IPOs to backing in other strategic business deals as well as taking major stakes in stocks and other financial instruments and even, of course, U.S. Treasuries. So these considerations that I've outlined tell us that our nation's economic security and our national security are inextricably interlinked with global energy security. This is a challenge without borders. The elements are interrelated and interdependent, but they affect us directly. So that means what? That means that we must understand the comprehensive global energy system, especially our policymakers, its impact on markets and national alignments as we shape our own national energy goals and strategies. And we have to realize that energy security and climate change are fundamentally linked challenges. Now, I'm involved with a task force at the Council on Foreign Relations on climate change mitigation. But I've made the point to them that they cannot talk about climate change in isolation, meaning it cannot be isolated from energy and energy security. And it cannot be delinked. We can't delink our global focus, our national focus, from a global focus. So let me talk about a practical definition for energy security. And it's really having an adequate and sustainable supply of energy to meet the needs and aspirations of citizens, commercial enterprises, and public sector functions. And to provide that 
in an, as environmentally benign a way as possible. And so that means that we need to build a comprehensive energy roadmap. And at its core, that roadmap should adhere to five basic principles. First, redundancy of supply and diversity of source. Second, well-functioning energy markets. Third, investment in sound infrastructure for energy generation, transmission, and distribution, including the necessary regulatory and operational protocols to ensure the safe and secure and reliable performance of refineries, power plants, the electrical grid, and other facilities. Fourth, providing for environmental sustainability and energy efficiency. And fifth, the development of policy alternatives which properly balance legal requirements with incentives. And this includes consistency of regulation and transparent price signals. And as Congress debates legislation and as presidential candidates lay out their own programs, each proposal should be examined to determine if it in fact would or could lead to a comprehensive national energy roadmap. Now like corporations and markets, states in this country and even cities are not waiting for a national energy plan but already are enacting legislation and regulatory requirements that address both energy costs and climate change. You know that a 1999 Texas law requires utilities to produce nearly 6,000 megawatts of electricity from renewable sources by 2015. And so technology investment in the state in such alternatives has already topped $1 billion. And the estimate is that carbon dioxide emissions have gone down by about 3.3 million tons. In fact, Texas leads the nation in wind-produced electricity. Iowa passed a similar law in 1983 and experienced something of a boom in wind turbine production. And in upstate New York, GE Energy has uh, announced an expansion of a major expansion of a plant focused on alternative energy. In New York City, Mayor Michael Bloomberg has called for a 30 percent reduction in greenhouse gases by 2030. Now you could ask, here's the, le the question for the student. Will these work? Will they work alone? Right. They can reduce load. But if you don't have a national and a global that recognizes global schemes, they won't work alone. So I would add a, an essential sixth element to a comprehensive energy formula, and that is robust innovation. And that's innovation both in technological advances, in business process innovation, and in policy alternatives. Because we must in, in, innovate the technologies which uncover and exploit new fossil energy sources. We're not going to get away from fo fossil-based energy anytime soon. And the most well-developed infrastructure for not just uh, exploration and production, but for distribution, rests with our fossil-based <coughs> energy companies, our oil and gas. And so we should partner with them as we think about where we go and how we introduce the energy from new sources into our economy. But we also must innovate the technologies that conserve energy and protect the environment. We have to innovate the technologies which lead to alternative energy sources which are reliable, cost effective, and as environmentally benign as possible. And this can range anywhere from new nanostructured materials for photovoltaics to new materials for drilling and exploration to new imaging and computational techniques for those same purposes to new nuclear technologies to the science and technology of carbon capture and sequestration to hydrogen fuels, biofuels, and so on and so on. In terms of policy, Technological innovation must be seen as both a policy tool and a policy outcome. 
Now, public policy can be a driver of technological innovation if one provides both requirements and incentives. For example, with respect to nuclear power or alternative and renewable energy sources. In these cases, technological innovation could be said to be an outcome of policy. But innovation can be a public policy tool at the same time if one chooses to set standards, such as reducing carbon dioxide load in the atmosphere. Then technological innovation plays a role in schemes to use our fossil sources, such as carbon capture and sequestration, or potentially in completely closing the carbon cycle. I had some interesting discussions here with some of the faculty on some of these issues. But technological innovation on the scale needed requires multi-sector, multinational cooperation. But it also requires a consistent policy environment and one head that has longevity. But one sees this cooperation, interestingly enough, in agreements over the last two years between the US and Russia, for instance, in the nuclear arena to cooperate in R&D on advanced reactors including fast reactors, new reactor fuels, and fabrication processes, as well as advanced methods for recycling and transmuting spent nuclear fuel, as well as the development of exportable small and medium-sized reactors. A lot of people don't know about this stuff has you know, flown under the general radar screen. But what many people also don't realize is that between the US and India, with our agreement, that yes, had a focus on nuclear R&D, was also a focus on deep ocean drilling and gas hydrate extraction techniques. But again, we need a comprehensive energy roadmap because a patchwork approach will be ineffective. It'll be cumbersome for business to navigate and it will fail to optimize the inherent opportunities embedded in the energy challenge. But innovation requires investment in R&D. And the question is, are we as a nation equipped to do that? Are we equipped with the human capital for robust innovation, the kind of innovation the energy challenge demands of us? As a university president and as a theoretical physicist, I have deep concerns about our national innovation capacity that it is in jeopardy because converging forces have created what I have called the quiet crisis, which is eroding the production of scientists, mathematicians, engineers, and technologists, the very people we need. The scientists and engineers who came of age in the post-Sputnik era, and I'm one of them, although I'm well preserved, <laughs> are beginning to retire and will retire more in the coming five years. At the same time, we are no longer producing sufficient graduates to replace them. And this looming talent crisis is already evident in the nuclear and the oil and gas sectors, but in government as well, in critical areas, in areas that even relate to national security. I should say especially relate. Now the rate of growth of talented international scientists, engineers, and graduate students coming to the United States has slowed. We have depended on this exquisite talent from abroad for a long time. 40% of our PhDs in science and engineering were born somewhere else. 30% of the master's degrees. But other nations are investing in their own research and education enterprises, offering new opportunities for their own students and their own scientists and engineers to study and to ultimately work at home. The flattening world means that they also can find employment elsewhere, not necessarily in the United States. And there's been a parallel decline of investment in the US in basic research by the federal government, especially in the physical sciences and engineering. And that's been shrinking, driven by concern over big government, limits on federal spending, concern for federal deficit growth, and in confidence in market-driven private sector research. By some estimates, the federal science research spending has declined by half as a percentage of GDP since 1970. 
And the final key factor is that our demographics have shifted and are shifting. Because the new majority among our young people in the United States now comprises young women and members of racial and ethnic groups which traditionally have been underrepresented in our advanced science and engineering schools in places like Rice University, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. But it is to these non-traditional young people to whom we also must look for our future scientists and engineers, even as we work to spur the interests in science and engineering of all of our young people. And as an educator, I'm concerned about all of our young people. But that means we have to tap the complete talent pool. So I fail to see how we can overlook 50% to two-thirds of our population and feel that we have tapped the complete talent pool. Now the quiet crisis is quiet because the true impact unfolds gradually over time. It takes decades to educate a biomolecular researcher or a nuclear engineer. And so, and we have this pool that we have depended on for so long. But by the time we recognize it, the crisis is upon us. And it is a crisis because our national innovative capacity rests solely upon the talents of this group that represents about 5% of our workforce. And so it ultimately rests upon our ability to interest and excite our youth to the marvels of science and engineering, to the wonders of discovery and innovation, and to the fact, to the fact, that an education in science and engineering can lead to multiple career paths as well, and to great wealth creation, and has. We tell the story too narrowly sometimes. Professors themselves contribute to it because we look for clones of ourselves, that unless people are going to become professors and researchers like ourselves, we think there are no pathways, no jobs. But if you look at the great enterprises and you look at the role of science and technology in the creation of those enterprises, if you look at some of the wealthiest people on the planet, that wealth has come from scientific discovery and technological innovation. Now, due to the efforts of many from multiple sectors, we actually have a new law, the America Competes Act, which seeks to address and mitigate these challenges of development of talent, as well as to create a specific new government entity. Some refer to it as ARPA-E, to spur new technological development and to speed market adoption of technological innovation in the energy area. But what we need is funding. And we need cross-governmental coordination to flesh out a robust energy roadmap and to enlist all relevant departments and agencies to make it come to life. We are a year out from our next national elections. At this time next year, we will have elected a new president. To achieve a comprehensive national energy plan requires the full weight and leadership of the nation's chief executive, as well as strong coordinated leadership in the Congress, and associated leadership at the state level, and partnership with the business sector. And only stability and consistency of outlook and linked federal and state regulatory policies and incentives can give us a comprehensive national roadmap that will make a real difference and that can spur the kind of risk taking and investments both on the part of established industry and on the part of venture capital and other sources of investment. These elements are important to provide the signals and confidence to the corporate and financial communities that will invest in uh, new energy systems and technologies and hire and spur the growth of the science and engineering workforce. And to ensure that those investments in new energy markets make business sense. There are many who are looking ahead to this time next year and to these issues. Currently I am co-chairing 
with Jim Owens, the CEO of Caterpillar, and Mike Langford, the national president of the Utility Workers Union of America, an energy security, innovation, and sustainability initiative launched by the Council on Competitiveness. But other national groups are looking at this as well, including the Council on Foreign Relations, whose task force on climate change is focusing on U.S. strategy for international engagement on climate change between now and 2012, with a view towards shaping action through 2050. The group is also connecting the issue of climate change to economic opportunity, jobs, and security. Now, I'm actually linked into that, and I tell them that you can't do it if you don't talk about energy. The Brookings Institution has an energy security initiative, which is reviewing energy security, energy policy, and climate change, focusing on international negotiations and the Bali United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change that meets this December. Now, actually, the energy security challenge that confronts us requires the very same capabilities that the U.S. has had in abundance, a higher education system that still is widely regarded as the best in the world, a well-developed science infrastructure, a financial system that provides access to capital, government structures that historically have had a record of supporting and investing in cutting-edge scientific work, and government policies that do encourage investment and entrepreneurship, a history of collaboration between the public and private sectors, and a culture of risk takers whose, where unconventional approaches to problems are welcomed, and a long history exists of taking great risks for great rewards. But it's been softening. So true global energy security will require a more complete understanding of energy markets and geopolitics the new players, and the new alignments. It will require innovation of the highest order and government support for the undergirding R&D. But it also will require unleashing the human talent, tapping the complete talent pool, if we really intend to accelerate innovation. We've witnessed challenges and addressed them like this before. The launch of the Soviet Sputnik satellite in 1957, followed by a history-making flight of a Russian cosmonaut in 1961, set into motion a space race, which was actually a science-based defense race that was transformational. And my own life was transformed, in fact, by what happened in this country after the, law, the launch of the Soviet a satellite in 1957. But it was really the convergence of two events. The 1954 Brown versus Board of Education decision that desegregated the public schools and caused the desegregation of the public schools in Washington, D.C., where I grew up the next year. And that and what happened with the science and math curriculum curricula in schools after the launch of the Sputnik satellite opened a window in time for me. But one, because of my family background, my own interests, talents, I stepped through. And that's why I'm standing here today. You know, John F. Kennedy issued a call to action in May of 1961 and restated here at Rice University in September 1962, the nation's resolve to land a man on the moon and to return him safely to the earth before the end of the decade. Now, you know that effort was led by one of my predecessors as president of Rensselaer, a Rensselaer alum, the 14th president of Rensselaer, George Lowe, who was deputy administrator of NASA and had overall responsibility for the Apollo program. And so he responded to this call 
when Kennedy urged that the United States rally its intellectual, industrial, and economic resources to this challenge. And his challenge was considered by many at the time to be unattainable. And there was considerable concern about how much money it would cost. But he said, Kennedy said, we choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade, not because it is easy, because it is hard, because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. That was the leadership. The Congress and the nation responded. The wave of activity that followed included an intensive focus on identifying and providing the necessary education and research supports to those who were interested and talented to go into those fields, and because of things like the Brown decision that included people like me. And the nation's achievements in human space exploration executed a course from the Johnson Space Center and its celebrated mission control here in Houston showcased American innovation, American democracy, and restored American prestige worldwide. And from all of this came exponential advances in an extraordinary number of fields, from healthcare and medicine to communications and transportation, things that have changed the way we live, how long we live, and where we live. So for decades, we have avoided facing tough realities. To work through them now, we will have to make tough decisions, commit to consistent policies, and follow through. In the spirit of President Kennedy, we should feel positive about the challenge and take it up with resolution, clear-headedness, and yes, even enthusiasm. Nations are realigning. Corporations are reassessing and shifting their investment decisions. U.S. states and cities are legislating changes. And while national legislation under debate addresses some aspects, we still have no comprehensive national energy plan. That doesn't mean picking winners and losers. Be real clear. It means having consistent focus, policy, framework that has us look at source for sector of use, evaluates technologies, evaluates full life cycle costs, and makes the investment in R&D and in human capital that we need. We need a new call to action, a call that will ignite our commitment and our collective imagination, a call that will secure the investment and the innovation needed. In short, we actually need a national conversation led by our national leadership to help our citizenry understand what is at stake and to motivate all to action. The open question remains, will we have the leadership to enter as a nation more fully into the global energy restructuring or will it go on without us? Because indeed, global energy security is the space race of this millennium. Thank you very much. Dr. Jackson, we have a few questions. Am I on? Can anybody tell? Can you hear me? Thank you. So, first question. First of all, thank you for those wonderful remarks. Uh, you certainly grace us by being here and sharing uh, those words of wisdom and encouragement, I would say, in leadership. So we appreciate that very much. So first question, Dr. Jackson. In general, scientists are very hesitant to engage in public policy, even in these difficult times. 
What strategies will reverse this complacency? That's the hardest question. <laughs> that's the, that's the me softball. <laughs> well, I think science is hard. It takes a lot of energy and focus, a lot of solitary dedication, even as scientists work in teams with others to advance and make great discoveries. But I've often urged my colleagues, particularly through the science societies, uh, to engage more in public policy because it's going to take a recognition that if we're not consistently involved, that when we come along to the party because we see that things are not going the way we want, then we're just considered another interest group. And I see that all the time uh, in Washington. But it also probably will require some change in how we educate our students to have them not only have fundamental analytical skills and to be able to identify and solve complex problems, but to be able to work across disciplines and to work across sectors and to have intellectual agility across a broad intellectual front. Why? Because you don't want to get stuck in one place. And you have to be able to see the connection of what you do, even as you love the fundamental science, and I always have, to what is happening in the larger world. We've taken for granted what I call the Vannevar Bush Compact, the one that actually created the modern research university in the United States, which was a partnership between the federal government and our major universities to support fundamental research and the education of students with the understanding and the belief that without knowing specifics that that fundamental research would lead to new discoveries and developments that would redound to the larger good, to the strengthening of our economy and to our national security. But that compact is broken down. There are a lot of pressures, and we have to remember that compacts only exist when all the parties work toward them. And so we have to change a bit the education of our scientists and, and engineers. Thank you. We have a number of nuclear questions. Let me try to ask them together, and, and then uh, you can just pick, pick the ones you want to talk about. How long will our uranium supplies last? What does that mean in terms of uh, 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 future kind of reactor technologies that we need? Uh, will we be uh, uh, will we be enriching uranium uh, further? Will we be will we be uh, using breeder reactors? Uh, will we be doing things that previously we have thought were quite dangerous in terms of non-proliferation concerns? How do we deal with the public's uh, concerns about all things nuclear? <laughs> that was the easy question, right? Well, people already are looking at uh, new nuclear technologies in multiple ways. Uh, one has to do with new advanced fuel designs that still with, exists within the context of fission-based reactors but reactors that may be gas-cooled, may, they may be uh, water-cooled, but the fuel itself uh, lasts for a longer time. The operation of the reactors is more uh, passively safe because it makes use of more natural cooling phenomena and the like. And those things actually, in, interestingly enough, have both safety implications and non-proliferation implications because the less one has to change the fuel out, the less one has to worry about radiation exposure. The less one has to change the fuel out, the less one has to worry about diversion of nuclear materials. The second is that people are also looking at new types of uh, materials for reactors. For a long time, the Indians have used different materials. They've looked at thorium and and other nuclear material sources. 
Frankly, that's part of the reason why the United States uh, government wanted to have uh, a nuclear program uh, with the Indians. You know, they, they uh, existed in isolation for a fairly long time because of some early things they did, uh, but that's made them actually think uh, innovatively about a number of technologies. And then this issue of, of what makes the public have more confidence. I think because of the power of nuclear energy and because of its history, that is, from which it's derived, and because of some unfortunate accidents that we've seen, but Chernobyl is the more significant one, but Three Mile Island was non-trivial, there's always an edge. And so the only thing that can give, uh, I believe, the public confidence is continued high operational safety performance of plants, the belief in and the existence of a strong regulatory infrastructure, but one that addresses not only safety, but what we call material protection, control, and accounting that relates to nonproliferation. Um, and ultimately the uh, question, addressing the question of the disposal of spent fuel. Some people argue that relative to uranium supply, that a reason to recycle spent fuel, you know, at the end of a conventional fuel cycle, a lot of the fuel contains plutonium. And that's why people do not like to reprocess, because it typically would involve separating the plutonium from the rest of the um, fission products. But then one can actually make a mixed oxide fuel, mixed uranium oxide, plutonium oxide, and burn it in existing fission reactors. And so one thinks of that as kind of a twice-through fuel cycle that extracts uh, energy content from the plutonium while burning it up and therefore you're getting rid of it. But there are some who are unalterably opposed to separating the plutonium so people are looking at various techniques having to do with partial recycling that doesn't completely separate uh, plutonium from some fission products but nonetheless renders it reusable to recreate a new fuel. But that has its own safety hazards um, in terms of design of plants and safety of those who would operate such plants. And finally, a big issue that people are sensitive about is the movement of nuclear material. And that's whether we have a repository or whether we reprocess or do some partial thing in between. We've got to get the fuel from the 70 some sites where the 100 plus reactors are to wherever this is going to go on. Whether this is some reprocessing facility or this is a geologic waste repository. Now I believe that we have to break the log jam and do something because in fact de facto we are storing the fuel at 70 sites around the country. And the day is going to come, whether it's this year or 100 years from now, that we're going to have to move it. And so we have to get on with some decision that allows us to do what we need to do with the spent fuel. Let's take a couple more, and then I'm going to uh, <clears throat> hold them up like this and let Shirley take the last <laughs> one. And then I'm going to share these with her so she knows what excellent questions in addition to the ones that I've read, have come from you, but we won't have time to do all of them. This is an important one also. What does, uh, what can the everyday person do, if anything, to impact or weigh in on all of these things you've been talking about? Well, many people say that the greatest source of new energy is avoided energy use. And so what the everyday person can think about is reducing energy use, as well as making energy efficiency choices, whether it has to do with lighting or cladding on your home or uh, more energy efficient vehicles you drive. But also, people can try to understand a little bit more what, what is at stake. But those of us who are 
in the public policy arena, in the energy business, in uh, government, have to do a better job as well with educating the public to what some of the options and choices are. You want me to pick one? Uh, no, I, 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 want, I, I want to be sure I ask you because um, uh, it's the kind of thing that I think is on, uh, on the minds of, of lots of folks, and it really has to do with a question about serving on a board of a major oil company uh, where uh, the, there are demands of the stockholders and, and the best in, what's in the best interest of the, of the con company and one's responsibility as a board member, at the same time recognizing the importance of other sources of energy and, and the trade-offs that are going to have to be made by society. Is that, is that some kind of conflict of interest? Not you personally, but for a company, for a major, <laughs> for a major oil company. Um, I don't think so. I mean, we have a major oil company executive in the audience. We may have others. But no. The oil and gas companies are in the business of providing the energy that a society needs to power what it does, to sustain our standard of living. Those same companies, more than the general public may realize, are very focused themselves on energy efficiency. They're thinking as well more and more about steps that they can take to mitigate uh, greenhouse gas emissions and things that people think may contribute to climate change. They operate in a very challenging environment, one that requires huge infrastructure, major capital investments that for any project is on the order of billions of dollars. And they operate and look for resources in environments that are hostile. Sometimes they are hostile because of the natural environment, but increasingly the environments are hostile because of the geopolitical and other environment. We're not going to easily move away from, not in our lifetimes, a dependence on fossil sources. And therefore we have to think in a dual way. We have to look comprehensively at the role of alternative and renewal, renewable energy sources. Look at the role of energy efficiency. But look at how we can both find the resource using new technologies, and I'm talking fossil resources, but give more attention to the kind of technologies that can allow us to extract and use them in a more environmentally sustainable way. It is not a conflict of interest because my interest is always on the future, on maintaining our lifestyles while recognizing and respecting the needs and desires of other countries to rise. And many of the oil companies, especially the one on whose board I sit, focus as well, as well on uh, its responsibilities in the countries from which it extracts the resources. And that's important as well, to be good citizens, not only of the United States, but global citizens as well. I thought you might want to answer that one. Thank you. But now, here's our... I'm not looking. <laughs> this is an easy one, I hope. <laughs> What would the energy cost to be in 25 years, in 50 years, relative to inflation? Thank you, everyone. Uh, one thing Dr. Jackson said in their extraordinary remarks was that we in the science community are often guilty uh, of trying to clone ourselves with our PhD students and so forth. That, that's true, and I think we do need to be sensitive about that. But, you know, if, if we are going to clone somebody, let's clone a few more Shirley Jacksons. Thank you very much, Shirley. <laughs>